There have certainly been times when walking into a pet store, let alone a healthy pet store, has been overwhelming. Whether I just didn't know what to get because my cat or dog was sick, or I knew I wanted something better for food, but the labels were confusing. That's why I'm so glad that there are more and more healthy pet store owners and pet advocates out there to help. Krista Fox and Jeff Dury own Pug and Hound Apothecary in Illinois, and along with their Insta-famous pug, Bruce, they're helping pet parents and their pets find healthier alternatives to food and medicine. As you'll hear in today's episode, Krista and Jeff have an extraordinary background in the pet industry and each have a passion for helping people and their pets. Oh, and don't let the fact that they're in Illinois fool you. No, they also offer online consultations. So stay tuned because I have a feeling you'll fall in love with this super duo as much as I have. And P.S., I bet you can't guess what their favorite foods are. Make sure to stick around till the end to find out. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on The Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So Krista and Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm so interested in your story and Bruce's story and how Pug and Hound came about and and what you do to help people. Can you um, kind of tell everybody a little bit about your story and how how you got to where you are today? Well, um, started out uh, with Bruce, of course. Um, Bruce, my little black pug, um, had a fairly normal, healthy life. And then around five years old, uh, started to have some back issues, uh, had his first spinal surgery, and shortly thereafter, um, I started to, I was already working at a, a natural pet uh, health food store, but um, I got really passionate about it and really wanted to uh, see the other side of things. So I decided to become a veterinary technician, um, started out at a uh, very conventional practice, learned a lot, good and bad. Um, and But it helped me learn a lot about Bruce and have the tools to start learning more about what he was going through and more about the body and stuff like that. Um, And then, gosh, I started working for a chiropractic neurologist for animal, his his wife, who's a vet and an animal chiropractor. Um, So I started to get a lot of experience. Um, And then I met Jeff. And Jeff and I decided to um, take our shared passion for, you know, feeding animals fresh and um, natural alternatives and turn it into a brick and mortar store. So that is pretty much our story, but it's all because of, it's all because of Bruce and everything I've, I've learned about Bruce. And then he's just basically been the, the catalyst for our business growing the way it has so that we can help so many other pet parents, um, know that there are other alternatives out there in terms of just, you know, food, uh, medicine, herbal remedies, just giving people the power to make a little bit more of an informed decision when um, their pet has an impending health issue. So that's that's pretty much it, right? Yeah. Yeah. right. That's so important. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> well, what got you interested in um, natural health for animals, Jeff? Um, I was working at a self-dog wash um, and just kind of saw all these dogs coming in with medicated baths and got some books from the library. Um, I actually read Puck as Promised by Ted Carasotti, and I thought it was about, like, how you feed dogs. But I, you know, checked it out from the library, and it kind of was about that, but about so much more and how dogs should, you know, it was about as how, you know, it just opened my eyes into the world of animals and how they should be treated and what we actually how we do treat them. And I watched a customer came in, told me to watch Pet Fooled. So I watched that. Um, 
the next day I just messaged the page and I got a message back and didn't realize I was actually talking to the director, Cole Harrington. And from there, I just kind of realized that pets don't have a choice. You know, it's up to us to make those decisions. And when you're being told to just feed cereal, 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 you know, and it just doesn't seem right. And I was sitting there one day and just thought, you know, what animal cooks their food? And that's my question. I ask everybody to just get up thinking and nobody, you know, everyone just laughs like you did. And well, none of them do. It's like, well, then why do we just feed this ultra processed cereal to our animals all the time and wonder why they're itching or scratching or getting sick? Um, you know, so I just got more and more into it. And unfortunately I bought the wash and then closed it and then was working in another pet store in McChrista and, you know, with her working in the veterinary industry, you know, brought a different aspect that I thought we could bring the, you know, people and having the store on more of the logical, you know, common sense approach. And then if people want to get really technical, you know, Krista can, you know, step in and, you know, really get to the nuts and bolts of things. But, I, you know, a lot of it just starts with the diet. That's the one thing they're getting, you know, two, three times a day, depending on how often you feed and then all the other treats that, you know, people don't think about it. Like there will be people that, you know, feed fresh food, but are still giving like really bad treats or, you know, giving them popcorn and bread and things that they should. I saw so. a list <laughs> yesterday of safe foods for dog to eat by someone they posted on Facebook and popcorn and bread were on the yes side and garlic and avocado were on the no side. And I'm like, no, this list, like, why would you give your dog bread? There's no... Okay, I mean, that's just... But that's all what we're all about, is helping people understand what's myth and what's fact. Because yeah. those lists will go around Facebook and people just take them at face value. And it's like, no, do you actually understand that the avocado thing... Was well, that's based? what it said. It, there was another list where if you actually, like, clicked on the link, it's like, well, they can eat the inside of the avocado, <laughs> but not the pit. I'm like, who's going to feed their dog a pit of avocado and think it's good for them? Or there was one where it was, like, raspberries. <laughs> Don't feed them a lot. Like, I'm not giving my dog a bushel basket full of raspberries. If they give a couple of them, that's great. Like, <laughs> you know, the disconnect with some of these things and people that come into the store and like, well, I saw it on this or it was, you know, on Facebook group, you know, they need those dry things to clean their teeth, you know, the crunchies. Yeah. And I just say, well, 90% of dogs at least and cats eat kibble and 90% of dogs and cats have dental disease. So I'm not sure how it's working. Yeah. So that's my, you know, the common I'm sense. Sure. I have so many questions. <laughs> so, yeah. well, but it's so important, especially to meet people where they are. So, yeah, I absolutely love like how you two come together because Krista, you have more technical knowledge, more, you know, from being a vet tech and working. Um, as a medical professional with animals. Um, so having having the two of you together is like, you're like a, a superhero team, right? <laughs> we do our best. Um, but I, I want to hear, uh, so Bruce is, yeah. <laughs> Bruce is kind of um, famous in his own right. Can you tell me a little bit about what, here, what his story is, what, he's been through and how you help him. So Bruce, um, like I said, started out like perfectly healthy. Like I couldn't even make, I have, I had insurance for him. Thank God. Um, couldn't even make his insurance deductibles year after year. And I almost canceled his insurance. And then Bruce, which is an important lesson. Um, my life took a pretty bad turn in 2015. And unfortunately I learned much later, um, that Bruce took on a lot of the the stress and the trauma that I was experiencing. And unfortunately it um, took its toll on his back and he had to have a spinal surgery. And after that, um, you know, I did rehab with him. I was, you know, trying to do the best I could to maintain his health and wellness. And he did all right um, for a couple years. And then he developed a secondary condition called neurogenic bladder. And that condition is where he lost control of um, being able to pee. So he actually retains urine. He's not incontinent in the sense that he leaks. He actually retains it. Um, and that was due to 
a spinal cyst that developed in the same spot as his first injury and first surgery. So I had to go to UW-Madison to see a spinal cyst specialist, and they broke up the cyst uh, surgically, but it did not um, give him the ability to urinate again. So I have to catheterize Bruce twice daily. I've been doing that for five years now. Um, completely painless for him, but his his condition, um, you know, because the spinal cord feeds everything in the body. So when the spinal cord starts to de degenerate, um, you have to manage that proactively. And so I do that the best I can um, by first and foremost, maintaining his gut health, making sure um, he's always got as healthy a microbiome as possible. Um, he gets chiropractic adjustments on a weekly basis from Dr. Carl DeStefano, who is arguably one of the best animal chiropractors in the world. So I'm very blessed. Um, gets acupuncture every week. He goes to physical therapy, gets massage, cold laser, goes in the water treadmill, also gets massages independently <laughs> every week. Um, so I do everything I can to make sure that I can at least keep him balanced. I'm not, you know, unrealistic thinking like my dog's going to walk again. That would be great. But I do everything I can to keep his body from further degeneration or feeling any, you know, ill effects of his spinal cord condition and just keeping his quality of life as high as possible. And we deal with that a lot at the store, you know, between back issues, between Frenchies, pugs, dachshunds, corgis, all these dogs have so many back issues, but the secondary issues that come along with these back issues, um, I'm very grateful that I work with who I do because I've learned so much um, that I can help other people understand how their dog's back condition is going to affect the rest of their health and how to be proactive and, and maintain it with, especially diet. Fresh food is super important for um, any dogs with an inflammatory condition, but um, so we really, we really hone in on that and then help them pick the right supplementation, um, you know, the right treats so that their dog can maintain their health and longevity as long as possible. So. He always thinks I have treats in my hand. <laughs> so that's why he's always trying to stare at me. <laughs> I, I did that in the morning. I'll pretend like I don't have treats and then he'll, you know, <laughs> he looks and then, okay, then I'll put a treat in my hand after like four times of doing it. So now he just thinks there's magically going to be treats every time. And, but as you can see, he's quite happy and sassy. <laughs> like he amazes people when people ask how old he is or, you know, what's going on with him. They're like, I can't even believe he's going to be 12 in a week. And it's just, it's incredible. He was only given a year to live when he was diagnosed with this bladder condition. And I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can. And he is absolutely thriving despite all that he, <laughs> that he deals with. He's a happy little guy. <laughs> That's so awesome and really such an inspirational story because I feel like, and I hate, I hate to say this out loud, but I mean, people need to hear it. So many people in your situation may have euthanized their dog because it's so much to take on and you don't know that your dog is going to have a quality of life, especially if you don't feel like you can manage everything he needs. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to tear up. I'm going to, I'm going to stop right there because I'm tearing up, <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's a hard decision and how, you know, how, why, why, how have you like managed to do all of this? And it's like, well, if I can, I will, I, I will extend any resource, any knowledge that I need well, to get. And, and I think he had the right mom, too. <laughs> you know, like things happen, you know, it, it's <laughs> odd how things happen that. You know, they were like, well, you're either going to catheterize well, him or express his butter. And I'm then like, well, I know how to look catheterize. what it's led to is what I meant. You know, like it led to now we have a store and there's more people, you know, there's it's odd how certain things happen. And it's, you know, like you said, no one, if you can't take on that, it's not that you're any less of a pet parent. Um, I think so it's just that's a hard thing knowledge. with people and the, the knowledge, but the catheter, you know, when you have to go that extra mile like she does, that's. You know, asking a lot, you know, of people. And if you can't provide that quality of life, then that's why, you know, that's the best thing we do for our pets is if there's no quality of life and we know it, you know, we can be. We can give them that mercy. Yeah, instead of just holding on for ourselves at times. You know, and that's the hardest part that we deal with at the store is when is 
you know, we want to do all these things for, you know, the pets that come in and the people that come in, especially because they're part of the family. And it's, you know, that's the hard part that we struggle with. And Krista had a, you know, a great thing of making a list of your dog's 10 favorite things. And when you can't, you know, do more than two of them, then you really got to look at making that decision of, you know, what's best for our animals. And, you know, it's, it's hard, but, you know, we're here to provide people with, you know, all the resources we can, all the information that we've garnered over the years and learn from people to give their pet that best quality of life possible. And, and I mean, it's from start to finish. We're talking about the finish, but just like examples of the start, we had a, a regular customer who was like, Oh, I'm getting my dog neutered tomorrow. And Jeff talked to him, I know, about the pros and cons of neutering. And the dog didn't really have any behavioral issues or any particular reason for getting neutered. So I actually sent him to uh, caninesports.com. It's Dr. Uh, Chris Zink. Dr. Zink has some great articles on the gonadectomy and things like that. And I'm like, here, go to this site, take a look at the information they have here, um, and then make your decision. And I'm like, and now they're starting to do vasectomies for dogs, which sounds crazy, but... You know, it's keeping, you know, that hormones going through them that they need to help develop. Um, so, you know, he looked into it and he called me back like 45 minutes later. And he's like, I just want to tell you, he had the appointment scheduled for yesterday. I think it would have been. He's like, after looking at that, he's like, I canceled the appointment. He's like, I'm going to do some more research. He's like, there was no reason that he was getting it done. There was no health issue for the dog or anything like that. So he's like. You know, I told them, like, I appreciate the call that, you know, that's why we're here is trying to give people the information and then they can do with it what they want. But as long as they have some trusted information, you know, it's easier to make a decision rather than, you know, Dr. Google or whoever's out there, because you're going to get pages and pages no matter what you say. If you ask the question a certain way, you're going to get those responses. So everyone's very convincing because everybody has a website everybody you know can put letters next to their name or get someone to say well this happened in one dog out of a million and that's where you know you got to kind of it's like the options i mean that's that's what we try to remind people you know when they're like oh i'm gonna i i need to do some more research that's what we do that's all we do we try to sift through it all to make it so that people can find the trusted good information rather than spending countless hours not looking for the right things, not knowing who's who. Like essential oils are a great example. I had a cat customer that came in um, the other day and she said, oh, you know, I heard they're really toxic to animal, to cats. And I said, actually, you should really check out Dr. Melissa Shelton, see what she has to say about this. Um, I, you know, I briefly explained to her, you know, cats metabolize essential oils different ways, the difference between like really hot oils and oils that are more tolerable, more safe. And she just, her mind was completely blown. She's like, well, anytime I've looked it up on the internet, it says they're bad. And I was like, well, you can also Google is the earth flat and you will find people that will give you solid evidence that the earth is flat. So like you said, you can, you can Google whatever you want and it'll support whatever hypothesis you're trying to figure out. So it's our job to get through all of that information, know who's a real expert in the field who really understands this and sift that out for our customers so that they can make a better informed decision, even if they do go and research things on their own. Yeah, all of that is so, it's so important. And I have a, um, I don't know if you got a chance to meet Janet, who owns Pupology here where I live. Um, but she, she's just like you guys trying to, yeah, trying, trying to help, you know, every dog in our little town one person at a time (laughs) kind of like you you guys are um and it's it's it is tough especially when you have people that are just so i i know what i read online and so many of the things you've brought up are the comments that i get every day on youtube like i i was up this morning answering youtube comments and there was another person commenting that you can't have essential oils around cats or you can't have citrus around cats and i'm like come on people <laughs> why am i answering these same things over and over and over again but um to kind of go back you were mentioning gut health earlier and i i, I was hoping to i don't know maybe you have an example um because i see this all the time, like literally every single day on social media, and I'm sure y'all do too. 
everybody's like, what probiotic can I give to my dog? What probiotic is best? I need to give my dog a probiotic. And, and of course, like they have no context when they're asking these questions. So I always am like, okay, well, first of all, what's going on with your dog? What are you feeding your dog? Um, what do, why do you feel like you need a probiotic? Just to try to pry more information out of them. Um, and I personally also think that, that just throwing probiotics at a situation is not going to, it's, it's not like a, a magic bullet that's going to fix everything in your dog, especially if you're still feeding highly processed food. I, that's, that's <laughs> um, do you have any examples? No, go ahead, finish and then we'll I'm answer. sorry. sorry. There's a delay. Oh, no, I was, do you have any examples of maybe customers you've helped who they're coming in just looking for a probiotic and you really help them see past, like, there's so much more that we need to do than just throw a probiotic at your dog? Well, I think it's the current, the current market and where things are going. Obviously, the health industry and even the pet health industry is understanding that the microbiome is very important and so probiotics are becoming this marketing term the probiotics are in everything because we do understand that the microbiome is the center of the immune system inflammatory response all of that but like you said it's just not that simple you really do have to to ask further questions i mean we love adored beast probiotics but there's four different ones and they can be used for different reasons not every dog needs you know phytosflora or healthy gut so trying to sift through that and help them make that decision while addressing all those other health concerns and going, eh, is this really the issue? But it's also not always just a powder probiotic. You can get it from a lot of other places. So, you know, again, that goes back to diet. If you're just looking for a powder to fix it, you know, and that's what we tell people, like, if it was easy, I'd have a, you know, shelf stocked with one thing that's going to fix everything. And if you're just going to the doctor to look for something that works once, like we all know it's going to work the one time and then there's, it's, eventually not going to work you're going to have to do something stronger you know it's you know it amazes me when people come you know from the vet and the, their dog had you know loose stool or diarrhea and they're like well I'll give them a bland diet of just chicken and rice it's like well when they're sick the chicken's fine for them when you're cooking it but any other time stay away or you can't feed them any you know better food you know and that's what we try and stress is you can take you know medicine when it's needed is great you know, it gets rid of certain things. But, you know, another example of learning through Bruce was having to support his body after, you know, you get rid of whatever bacteria, you know, might be bad or good. Um, but a lot of times, you know, with people, it's not just if they're looking for one probiotic, it's like, well, are you doing a digestive enzyme as well? Um, you know, it's it can't just, you, you know, throwing a probiotic at one thing isn't just going to fix it, like you said. And then, you know, we've learned you know, over time too, and it makes sense just rotating between good ones you find because there's different, you know, strands you're going to inoculate with better, you know, probiotics or different probiotics, I should say, with each one that you, you know, rotate between. So you're giving your gut the best chance of, you know, being as strong as possible, your immune system. And that's all you can do is lessen, you know, toxins in the world and give your body the best chance to fight it off because, the end of the day that's all we have medicine will get you so far but then it's up to your body to take it the rest of the way or you know you're and you know that's just it's not going to work if you can't support yourself eventually you can you know and with the probiotics you know like you said rotating is key but you you have to achieve balance in the gut there should be a balance of good and bad bacteria bad bacteria obviously should be in small manageable amounts but if you over inoculate with probiotics, even though that, you know, sounds like a good thing, it's actually not. It'll it'll cause just as much of a problem as a bad imbalance can. You'll see like massive amount of bloating, gas. I mean, I did it with Bruce. I accidentally over inoculated my dog and thank God Julianne Lee was like, You're fermenting him. <laughs> He's fermenting himself in his gut. So you definitely can you definitely can overdo it. So it's it's important, you know, especially with probiotics, people think, oh, my dog has allergies, I'm just going to do probiotics. Well, if your dog has, like, a severe food intolerance, you need to address, like, the gut lining, not just what's in the gut, but the actual structure of the gut itself and doing things like humic and fulvic and butyric acid, things that, you know, actively help repair the gut. 
in addition to probiotics, whole food probiotics, things like raw goat's milk, raw kefir, stuff like that, where, you know, you can give this whole diversity while trying to balance your animal and repair them. Good, you know, good soil veggies. You know, you get probiotics, you know, and that's where I had a customer come in too, and she's like, well, I don't want to feed this because, you know, it has too much veggies, you know, veggies in it. The dogs don't need that. And I'm like, well, what are you feeding? She's like, well, you know, 80, 10, 10. And I'm like, that's all you're giving your dog? Like, that's, you know, Dr. Becker was a big fan of it. She's since, you know, seen the ramifications of only doing that and since changed, you know, up her opinion about it a little bit. And when you know something's beneficial, why not, you know, give it to your dog or take it yourself? It doesn't mean that's all you're going to, you know, incorporate into the diet. You know, wild animals, I mean, our dogs eat grass. So to say that they don't eat any kind of vegetables or they wouldn't pick out vegetables is just... We know that they it's, do. It's we ignorant. Know do. You know, you just don't want to, you know, admit to it. You know, so adding beneficial layers to, you know, our diet, to our dog's diet, and it shouldn't even be diet because there's not one person or one, you know, that eats the same diet their whole entire life. You're always adjusting. You're always finding different things that work for you at different stages of your life. And that's, you know, how it should be. You know, and the other thing that's going around now that's popular is, you know, it's just food. You know, food is food. You know, there's no dog food. There's no human food. It's just food. And that's so true. And when people switch to, you know, more fresh food, they want to get down to the, you know, the half ounce of food that they're feeding. And like, oh, well, how many ounces? It says he can get six, but I'm not sure if I should, you know, and they give him more. And I'm like, you're not going to harm your dog with fresh food. You know, you're not going to harm yourself as long as you know it's quality and, you know, sourced well and fresh, it's not going to be a problem. Just try and, you know, work through that idea that it all has to come from a bag yeah. and that it all goes in a bowl. And that's the only way the dog can eat. And you wonder why they're anxious around the house or, you know, chewing things up. Like they sit at the house, you let them outside, some people, and then feed them in a bowl. And that's like their routine forever. And all they're eating is, you know, dead food, as you know, as well Speed. said, it's feed and it's, you know, add in fresh food. I had another lady. Well, we put all this chicken on top, and that's all he eats. And then it, the kibble's there, and if he's hungry, he'll go back later and eat it. And I'm like, well, he's telling you something right there. Yeah, I remind you know? people, you know, if, if a food made you sick, let's just say you're allergic or gives you a headache, you'd innately avoid that. Like, let's just say broccoli makes my stomach hurt. So I, eh, when I look at broccoli, not so sure. Dogs can't communicate that. If they are not ravenously eating and they're going towards their food and thinking about it, more likely they're like, oh, this kind of gave me a tummy ache last time. This makes my head hurt because the headaches are actually super common in dogs, but obviously they can't tell us they have a headache. Um, but things like that where people, when I tell people that, they're like, oh, that does make sense. Like dogs should love to eat. That's how they're hardwired to never know when the next meal is coming and be dying to get it. And it's, it's amazing how many people are just like, oh, yeah, they just eat when they want. I'm like, does that, does that really make sense to you that, you know, an animal would just go up to the bowl and be like, yeah, I'll take two little kibbles and walk away? Because they're starving. They're doing it out of desperation. They're not doing it because they love their food. So it's, you know, little things like just changing how people think about their routines and what they think might be normal that's actually not. That's all about just education and advocacy, I think, that's what makes it so gratifying is we can help people with these little tidbits of education slowly, but surely they start to make changes and then they see huge differences in their pet's behavior, their well-being, you know, their overall quality of life improves so much just from these simple, gentle ways of helping people learn better and do better. I'm so glad that you brought up so many different behavioral issues because normally I'm the one bringing it up. Um, because I kind of started on this journey as a dog trainer and very, very quickly, I had already started feeding my, my own pets fresh food. Um, but I really very quickly started learning that the best way I can help people who are having issues with their dogs, they're calling me for training is by changing their diet because so much of what's going on can be attributed to diet in yeah. almost every home I've ever been in <laughs> where people are, whether it's like, you know, they're just, they have too much energy or and inevitably 
I'd say 90% of homes I walk into, they're calling me for, you know, I just want basic training, whatever it may be for a dog. And then they always somehow, well, yeah, he's kind of picky. He doesn't really like to eat and we're having a hard time and we keep trying different brands and he just doesn't want to eat. Okay, (laughs) let's dig into this because your dog, like you said, should want to eat. And I, and every dog is different, which is, I think, one of the obstacles in why we have, we, we wind up talking individually to people before they really have their aha moments is because every dog is an individual. And um, yeah, like my dog, she is just, I mean, she is the most princessy princess dog you would ever meet. And won't even like, uh, I've been trying for years to get her to munch on a bone and she won't, she's just very like, I'm delicate, but you put a plate of food in front of her. I did a, um, um, a huge board for her, for her birthday last year. And I like individual items and let me, she went through all of the raw meat first, then the cooked meat. She like licked at a couple of different fruits didn't touch the vegetables, then ate the scrambled egg. Like she's just very, she pushes away fruits and, but I have to, I have to give her, if I do it myself, I have to blend it. She's very like, give me meat. Or if like we try to give her a treat of a fruit or something, she looks at us like she's offended. (laughs) She's like, where's the meat? (laughs) Working with people individually is really important because, you know, I talk to people about, their dog's microbiome because you know when people transition from kibble to fresh there's usually some sort of gi uh, stress that they'll go through and i remind people that's because your people don't think about the bacteria actually being what's helping break down the food Mm -hmm. they think it's more of a mechanical process versus like a chemical process so reminding people that okay now your dog has been eating 60 percent carbohydrate let's just say on average when they're eating processed food, their microbiome has adjusted to processing majority carbohydrates. So when you go from a majority carb to a majority protein and fat, those microbiome are going to have to shift. And that takes a while. And again, people want like an overnight fix. It's very hard to do. I mean, depending on the age and um, health condition of the dog, it, it can vary. It can happen really quickly, or it can take months to get a complete, you know, switch over of the gut microbiome to, process fresh food and people I wish people had more patience with with that because it can be kind of daunting when people start to switch to a fresh food and go oh well they had diarrhea so I'm just I'm just going to stick with what I'm doing and it's like just give it some time the detox and the transition process takes a little bit just like us like you can't expect to go from my sister did it she did a pretty strict vegan diet and then ate a hamburger with us and she had some issues it's like dogs are going to have the same issues going from one very particular formulation of diet to a completely different formulation of a diet. So it's important working with people and reminding them of that process. So you, you know, so they don't feel so uncomfortable and disconnected. And I think that's at the core of what we do is not just telling people what's good for their dog, but why it's good for their dog and what their dog is going to go through due to these changes so that people do feel comfortable with that process versus just going, well, I bought fresh food. I don't really know why I got it. I don't really know what to expect. It's important to prepare people. And you have to do that by having those individual conversations. I I do have a quick question for you. If you don't mind me asking, I, it's been years now, a couple of years. When I switched my dog, I had, we, we didn't have faith in a company um, at one point and had to, I switched her, we, we rotate brands now, but when I did that, she was going from a fermented food to a non-fermented food. And she had a lot of GI upset, um, for a few days. And I was very concerned and it dawned on me. I was like, oh my gosh, that's when we started adding goat's milk. She gets goat's milk for breakfast and, and, um, then she gets her raw food for dinner. And I mean, within like a day, she was totally good. And I think, I I don't know, I'm just like in awe of the amazingness of goat's milk. Is that something that you (laughs) find with a lot of other dogs that it can really quickly 
clear up, especially in a dog who's otherwise healthy, um, quickly cl clear up a lot of, you know, GI issues, upset. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's our, that's our go-to. Even, you know, if I have a client who it's not in their budget to feed entirely fresh, we always err on the side of goat's milk. So getting, oftentimes getting them to add the goat's milk mm -hmm. to the dry food that they're feeding that's when the light bulb starts to go off that their dog really just does want to eat fresh food because then they won't eat the dry food without the goat's milk. So it becomes not only a wonderful way to boost the bowl for people who can't afford to do entirely fresh, but for the people that might just be hesitant and they start with goat's milk, it's usually the stepping stone for them to see the benefits of feeding a fresh food. And just the it's, it's crazy how, how beneficial this, Plain old raw goat's milk can be for these dogs. Yeah. I mean, it's, the, it has everything in it. I don't think people realize that when I, we have like kind of strange belief systems when it comes to milk. So explaining, you know, the benefits of raw milk and, you know, the difference between raw milk and what, you know, cow milk that people buy at the grocery store and how beneficial that raw milk is just in terms of everything that's in it, that it has everything, every vitamin, mineral, amino acid, digestive enzyme, probiotic, it's got everything in it. So I think it's a great all in one add on for just about any dog out there. It just does so much with just such a tiny little adjustment. Yeah. I, um, I'm just so like, I, I love, I love your story. I love what you've done with Bruce. And I know that at Pug and Hound, you also offer consultations for people that may not be local to you, which is most people. <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about that process and what people can expect if they go to your website and decide they want um, a consult with you? So, yeah. Um... I started doing the consults oh, probably about a year ago just because our store got so busy that I didn't have the one-on-one -on -one time that I used to have with people when they'd walk in the store, and I really wanted to give them my undivided attention. So I do local and distance um, consultations for people whose animals are dealing with acute or chronic health concerns that they're just not seeing what they need to from their veterinarian, which is usually from a conventional, traditional um medicine perspective. There's just limited tools. So um, that's where I come in to help them not only understand what's going on with what they're currently doing with their veterinarian, help foster a good vet client relationship so that they can make certain adjustments comfortably again with that education. But people get my one-on-one -on -one undivided attention in terms of going over lab results, um, your, your dog's medical history, where we can see some connections being made um, all of that, it's, it's just a way for me to be able to give them a concrete plan instead of, you know, when people come in the store, I can give them tips and tricks, but, um, it's, it's much more organized to do a consultation where I can go, okay, this is what we're dealing with. I have a nice questionnaire where I can get some things out of the way instead of having to take up a lot of time talking Initially, like I do with people in the store, like, oh, are you spraying your lawn? How many times do you feed? Are they neutered? Who is your vet? What medications are they on? All of these things can be done with an initial consult, and then I can really get in depth with people in terms of a plan, have follow-up. Um, people, you know, can reach out to me directly from their consult and then feel really comfortable with what they're doing and have, and have a good plan that they can go back to their vet. Or if they don't want to use their, their vet in the process, that's that's another thing too. But at least I can step in and go, okay, so you know your dog is dealing with Cushing's disease. Your vet probably hasn't talked to you about CBD. Let's talk about CBD, food, how those things are going to benefit your dog with Cushing so that they not only can implement those tools with confidence, but when it comes time to have that conversation with a conventional veterinarian, they can have confidence in knowing that what they're doing actually has legitimate you know, reasons by it, not just like, oh, some person told me to switch to fresh food and do CBD. Um, so it's just a really a way for me to get really in depth and detailed and um, just have that one on one time with people um, to use my knowledge base to do with what they need. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up CBD. Um, if I remember correctly, Jeff said that you might be a writer. 
for CBD yeah, Dog Health? I do. I do write blogs for CBD Dog Health. That's so awesome. I actually just had, I uh, just interviewed Angela yesterday. And um, so her episode's going to go up right before yours. So when you, if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to Angela's episode, make sure to go back after this one's done. <laughs> um, so that was awesome because I, it, I feel like there's so much, there's so much I don't know, but CBD is one of the things that it's like, I know, and I don't know. Like, I, I know I that I don't know. I love writing the blogs because um, I learned so much just having to do a ton of research on my own. I mean, I, I'll know a brief amount about you know, a certain topic, and then I get to really dive into the research and help inform people and make it, you know, easy to understand. But, I mean, the reason that we sell CBD dog health, again, was because of Bruce. Bruce had a secondary neurological issue that I – could not get under control with conventional drugs. I tried three other brands of CBD and Angela reached out to me personally and said, you know, I'm going to send you a bottle. Just try it with Bruce. Just please give it one more shot with CBD. And within two doses, his condition was resolved. And I was like, okay, there's definitely something different. About That's amazing. This and just Angela as a person. Yeah. Just a wonderful lady to work with. And I'm, I'm very honored to, you know, for them to have me on board. I, we, we love selling their products and the results speak for themselves. So CBD is a wonderful tool. It's just right now we're, we have an uphill battle with veterinarians feeling like they can't talk about it or they're going to lose their license. And it's not necessarily the case. A couple states maybe, but not, not around here. So helping inform people about things like that, where it, something, it's something that's definitely on a lot of people's radar, but they don't quite understand it or they've picked mm -hmm. a brand that's, not so great and didn't see the results they wanted were dosing it wrong so we we help come in and give people the good information and the right way to do things so that they do see results from it because it can be an absolutely life-changing addition to a dog's health protocol that's so so true i know just personally my mom was really skeptical about it when i recommended it to her for her dog who has anxiety around thunderstorms um because all she knows about it is that she can't take it herself because of where she works, because they're a government contractor. And I'm like, well, first of all, they're not testing your dog. <laughs> but that put negative thoughts in her mind about it, if, if that makes sense. So she's like, well, I just can't touch this at all for any reason. Um, so there are certainly obstacles um, around CBD, but I do think it's it's – like I was talking to Angela about, it's something that is provided to us in nature and like, it's there for a reason, I, you know, everything in nature is there for a reason. And if we can figure out how it can help us, I mean, how wonderful is that? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, if, you know, cannabis came back into our agricultural system, like it was hundred years ago, we'd have a whole lot of um, better outcomes in terms of people's overall health. It's, it's, it's sad how demonized it, it's become just because of basically the cotton industry. But I think, you know, slowly but surely the, the tides are turning. Um, but yeah, helping people understand the myths and misconceptions when it comes to hemp versus marijuana and CBD and full spectrum and all these terms that are going around, you know, Jeff is really good at, at putting it in perspective for people. I get a little too, technical and sciencey, so sometimes I have to take a step back, whereas, um, you know, Jeff's really good about making it simple for people to understand, because that's what it comes down to, is you can flood people with information, but sometimes people just get overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I told her. I said, give me CBD for dummies. That's what I need. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to it. I mean, we, we go over as a team with CBD Dog Health every Every week, new research, what's going on, you know, what states are changing in terms of laws. It's, there's, there's a lot, a lot constantly moving. So it's a lot of moving parts, but hopefully we're getting to a point where we can all have some sort of cannabis in our lives. <laughs> awesome. So do you do help cats at all? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, the one, my one employee actually, uh, she's our like resident cat person because we don't have cats and she was able to transition her cats from prescription urinary diet to raw food. And she's got a lot of experience there, but 
because of the stipulations and qualifications that we have for products in our store, most of our store is dog and cat because I don't carry anything with flour, sugar, salts, dyes, glycerins, anything like that. So it makes it pretty inclusive for cats. It's a lot of meat. Um, but we do have a lot of cat exclusive products, the two crazy cat ladies supplements. Um, we have a whole supplement section, flea and tick section for cats. Um, yeah, we have, we have a actually pretty decent cat selection now. So we're, we're more than happy to help cat people as well as dog people. Yeah. I, uh, there are some of the feline essentials that I think can also be used on dogs. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. I use uh, the urinary cat on Bruce for oh, a awesome. year ago. Yeah, yeah, that's I think yeah. people, especially when it comes to the dog and cat thing, people don't realize how similar they are. That it's it's you know it's cat people and dog people want you know their their animal on the bottle, but a lot of these things are ubiquitous to both species. There's certainly some exceptions there, but when it comes to food, it's it's pretty pretty similar. The the rules are pretty similar for both of them. So I think. There's a lot of misunderstanding with cats, for sure, that they're, you know, so much different than dogs in terms of their diet and their needs. And in some ways they are, but there's there's a lot of, um, what's that word, common grounds there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited for people to, of course, hear what you guys do and hopefully um, as you're listening, you're also going to, it, it's pugandhound.com. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, because, and, and you spell out and, pugandhound.com. Okay. <laughs> um, it, I'm hoping that as you're listening, you're going to pugandhound.com and you are looking over um, the resources there and considering a consult with, with Krista because I have found that most people either they either start with they have a health issue or their pet has a health issue and it kind of snowballs from there and and people really do need that individualized attention for the most part to really get going and feel confident in um being able to start making these decisions for themselves so i highly recommend that you you do check that out um I did want to ask y'all one more question, if you don't mind. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, y'all are maybe what someone might call foodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> um, I call my husband a foodie. He doesn't think he is, but compared to me, he's totally a foodie. I'm a very, like, I just want a plain steak with salt and pepper, nothing else. Like, give me a baked potato on a side, some fruit. I don't want anything fancy. I don't want to keep trying new things. Like, I just want the bare minimum. <laughs> you like what you like. <laughs> um, so I want to know what, <laughs> what your favorite food or meal is, each of you. I mean, for me, and me I, I, he, he knows. Cheese. It's cheese. <laughs> I love cheese. He got me Cheese of the Month Club for uh, my birthday. I, I, I love cheese. My favorite food is probably a quesadilla. I love just a simple corn tortilla and some um, quesadilla cheese. That's like my go-to snack if I'm feeling crappy. That's that's what I go to. But, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cheese for sure. Man, probably cheese. meat for him. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh... <laughs> The meat and cheese couple. Yeah, that's about <laughs> what it is. In meat. Charcuterie couple. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Prosciutto, probably. My dad came from Italy. He was, you know, came here when he was 15. My grandfather, growing up, he used to make his own prosciutto. So we had a little, like, sectioned off part of our basement that we used for, like, wine. He made his own wine, too. I did that growing up. But he'd hang the... You know, prosciutto in the wine cellar, salt it down, and then we'd wait months and months until it cured. And then he'd go down there, and all my friends would laugh. They're like, what is this piece of meat just hanging <laughs> in your basement for? And once we had, you know, once they had some, I mean, it was oh, Yeah, he introduced fantastic. me to, to prosciutto and cantaloupe. That's a That's, well, that's a an thing. appetizer in Italy. Prosciutto con melone. That's pretty so, damn good. I'm going to have to look for that. I haven't, I've been really into 
prosciutto on just a plain cheese pizza lately. So putting that on top, that's what I've really been into lately. So that's cool. But we're, yeah, I just said we're getting ready to go to Rome. So hopefully, maybe I can find that. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, it's, that's, you know, when I, I went when I was 15, and they used to like from 12 o'clock till about three, the whole country just shut down. It was lunchtime. Now I hear that's not the case anymore. One of our customers just got back and he's like, yeah, they, they don't do that anymore. Everywhere's more touristy now and it's open all the time. I'm like, that's a bummer. That was a, it was interesting because we, I was 15 at the time. So I'll be 45 next Wednesday. So it was 30 and Jesus, a long time ago, <laughs> <laughs> but we would go and like rent little Vespas and drive around, you know, all the different towns. And, you know, we ran out of gas at like one o'clock and we pull up to the gas station. There's all these old Italians sitting there and they're like, oh, no, we're closed. But if you want a beer, we'll give you a beer. <laughs> so we had a beer with them and then we couldn't, you know, we had to go. There was like one gas station that was open that we ended up finding. But then we learned, like, don't run out of gas before between 12 and 3 or you're not getting any. <laughs> so it was interesting. <laughs> Well, I'll have to let you know because I um, they have been reading a lot. We're in a Facebook group, plan Italy travel planning, and a lot of people do say that they shut down. Like they don't start until they ten. Don't. Yeah, they and I, they don't. Maybe in the smaller yeah, maybe towns, maybe I, I don't know about you know. And I'll yeah. tell you, the travel fountain is not going to be where you think it is. Okay. I promise that because it's like in there's buildings all around it. It's not like in this open area. Like it's just it was interesting because we looked for it for a while and then it's like you go down this alleyway and then you come to this opening and then there it is. So you would think that it's like hearing about it, like oh it's just you know big thing that's out in the middle of nowhere, but or you know out in the open, but it's not. So but it's it's I mean. I went, I remember all that, going to the Coliseum and walking around. That was really cool. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of uh, awesome food. and. <laughs> yeah, one day we'll get, to, we'll get to travel and go abroad and eat all that good food because we don't it's really fun. do anything else other than go out to eat. That's our, you know, our little vacation. So <laughs> we yeah, it's hard when you have pets, especially pets that have special needs. Totally yep. get that. But it, fortunately, a lot of places around around us that know, know and love Bruce, they let us bring him. Well, he doesn't so. go anywhere. He sits in a stroller. Yeah. He's never going to run around. He's never going to pee anywhere. So yeah. It's like, yeah. He's the oh. ideal dog. You are such a dog. <laughs> Looking at your dad. He certainly is adorable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's going to be 12. Uh, Look at that face. Uh, 19. I see his little... Yeah, we're having a big birthday party for him, raising um, money for a charity rescue organization, um, giving away frozen food, which is awesome. We've done a couple freezer giveaways over the past few years. Two freezer raffles. So we raise money for rescues. Giveaways, you know, either way. The rescues get all the money. We just, you know, sell tickets, and then we get some brands that donate some product that we put in the freezer for the people. So it's a good way to get people, you know, some people – don't have can't the do it. Space. They don't have the freezer space, or they, you know, they do, and they can only buy smaller portions. So it, you know, gets people interested, and it raises money for, you know, a good cause. They help people and pets all over the place. So uh, my niece actually introduced me to the ladies that founded it, and they're big. They're fresh feeders themselves, which yeah, it's hard awesome. to find. You know, and some rescues will promote it. Some of them, I understand they get what they can and you know, you have to do what you can for the animals and I appreciate it. But there's also that level of, you know, once they adopt the dog from you of, you know, educating them like, Hey, you should look into this. That way you're not just, you know, going to be that same cycle. Though some people give up these dogs because they have a lot of allergies or mm -hmm. this, that, or the other, that could be easily solved with, you know, a better diet. And that sometimes that upfront cost is too much. People are like, oh, I can't afford that. But it's amazing. Speaking of allergies, you know what the results that we see from from people who switch their dogs over to fresh and you know a couple supplements, CBD for sure. That's our go-to when people are like, what do you have for allergies? I'm like, well, I have a bunch of herbal remedies, but CBD is really going to be the best thing. And just seeing those when people take before and after pictures for us, it's it never gets old seeing the results of people making those changes for their dogs and not to mention how much happier 
It makes pet parents when they're not seeing their dog itch constantly. It takes anxiety off pet owners. So it's really a, a dual, dually beneficial thing to help people with their pets because you're helping them too. You're helping their whole household be happier because their dog's happier. So they bring us so much joy. They deserve it. Their lives aren't long enough and we got to do everything we can for them. They're so damn cute. That's so <laughs> true. You know, to give them the best quality of life for as long as they're on this, on this earth with us, giving all that joy and unconditional love. That is so true. I love that. I think we should end on that unless you have anything else you want to tell people to follow you on socials or anything. <laughs> yeah. Our website, or we're pretty active on Facebook and Instagram. Anything else? Uh, no, nothing really. I mean, just remember what animal cooks their food. <laughs> when you can answer that, I'll give you free food at Buggin' House. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both so much. I, I so appreciate you taking the time to do this and to keep spreading the word to pet parents about um, not just fresh feeding, but raising naturally healthy pets so um well thank you for having us we love we love to be able to spread the word and you know help people connect the dots yeah to... reach new people is always important you know we don't do a ton of advertising because it's hard you know you want to make sure that you're getting the people that you want and spending the money on the store is what we do we brought in a lot of new products and new things since we've opened to try and have that here for people so that's what we're most you know passionate about passionate about is expanding our store so getting out like this is awesome for us so thank you Appreciate um it. thank you so much for everything you do for pets and their parents um make sure you go to pug and and follow krista and jeff on the socials as well uh, especially facebook and instagram thank you all again yeah bruce oh. has his own instagram yeah. too <laughs> oh, yes what is it <laughs> This is Bruce Wayne Da Pug D A. Bruce Wayne Da Pug. Okay, yep. go follow Bruce. That's not, if you follow our our uh, Pug and Hound Instagram, the, the link to, to Bruce's page is on there too. So he is a stinker. Yeah, but yeah. thank so you so happy. much. Thank you very very much, and um, hopefully we'll have you back on. Okay, we look forward to it. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Bye. bye. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.